longer this morning since we're starting a little bit late. Um, I'll just make everything as fast as possible. Uh, I was asked to remind everybody to keep our cell phones off. Um, that's something that should almost go without saying these days. I'll remind you that the DVDs, if you get them today, they are $100 off for the conference DVD set. So that's a real good deal. And of course, I've got to remind you about the magazines. We've got lots and lots of back issues to uh, provide for you. So that's pretty much all of that. Our first speaker today is Dr. James Bear. I found, I learned a long time ago that if I have anything going wrong, it's best to go to a chiropractor first. And I've seen him a couple of times, and he's a real good chiropractor. He's been in practice over 30 years here in Albuquerque, and we are just really, really honored to have him. He is one of the very few people in this world who's taken a realistic view of what was going on with the technology of Royal Rice. I've been following him for many years in, in his uh, work on that, and he's been doing it about 14 years now, and he now has some key patents on the reconstruction of Rice technology. So let's please welcome Dr. James Bear. up a little more? Okay, thank you. Um, today I'm going to take some time here. I'm going to deconstruct some of the Rife legends and construct a new understanding for everybody of how frequency devices work. Now, I'm sure a lot of you in here are familiar with the Rife story. How many of you are not? Okay, there's several people. Well, let me give you just a quick synopsis. Uh, Develops a machine back in the 1930s that uses electromagnetic radiation to treat and cure infections and cancer. In 1934, 16 out of 16 patients are supposedly cured of their cancer in a clinic run by the University of Southern California. In the late 1930s, Wright forms a company, Beam Rays Incorporated, to make his new Wright Ray device. Beam Rays Company then falls apart by within a year or two. Uh, due to company infighting, Wright becomes a drunk and the technology is essentially lost in the mid to late 1990s. Some versions of it existed from the time of the 1940s onward. We'll be discussing some of that and showing some old machines. So let me say this about what people think about the Wright legends. And that is, number one, there is a big problem. Not worth it. There it goes. The problem is the Rife legend is, of course, full of holes, misdrews, misdirections, and outright fabrications. It's taken me 13 years, or over 13 years, more specifically, to sort out what was real and what was not. I'm going to show you how many of Dr. Rife's theories are incorrect, how the concept of shuttering a glass with resonance is a very weak analogy for what Dr. Rife was doing. And finally, I'm going to reconstruct the entire life treatment concept into a beginning science. So, these are some of the topics we're going to be discussing today. And we're going to go through each section kind of piece by piece. And some of this I'm going to go over pretty fast. And some of it I'm going to get into some elaborate detail. Now, let's talk about the first thing Dr. Wright supposedly was really, really famous for. So 16 out of 16 patients that were cured in what was called a clinical trial. Well, was it really a clinical trial? Well, here's what happened. In 1934, the folks down at the Scripps Ranch in San Diego, California, made an offer to some medical doctors at the University of Southern California. Some of them were educators at this medical school. They said, hey, come on down to our ranch, set yourself up a clinic in San Diego in the summertime, and you can have fun down here, you can make a few bucks, and you can treat a few patients and try some things out that you want to try on patients. So these doctors go down to San Diego, and one of the leaders of this is Dr. Milbank Johnson, who is associated with Dr. Reif. And Dr. Reif had, at that time, pretty well developed his instrument into a functional device and was able to cure cancer at least on a microscope slide and or treat cancer cells and destroy them on a microscope slide and also 
treat mice. So this was an opportunity to treat a few patients, and that was utilized. But did that clinic just treat only cancer patients? No. Now, here's some questions for you. Suppose you're a prominent medical doctor. You're from the University of Southern California. You're a known educator. You're well respected in your community. And you go down to this clinic, and one of the doctors there who you respect and is prominent goes, hey, I've been working with this guy, and he's got this new gizmo that treats cancer. And, and you, as a responsible physician, are going to look at this and go, well, you know, that's really great, but I treat cancer a certain way, and we know it works that way. I, we use surgery, and we re use x radiation to treat cancer. Do you think a lot of these doctors would just abandon their patients and say, well, here's a patient that presents with, say, like breast cancer, and go, well, first, let's go over here and let's go just treat you with this machine and see what happens. Do you think they'd do that and let that patient progress for another several months while the machine is operating? It's a question. And my personal belief is that probably didn't happen. I believe there might have been a triage system in which some patients would come in and they look at them and go, well, we can't do anything traditionally medically for you, so let's go treat with the machine because there's nothing else to do. And then some patients may have received a mixed treatment. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Some patients receive treatment of surgery and radiation. We don't know. We don't have the records. But what happened after the treatment? Well, some of the urban legend is that, well, everybody was cured. They stayed cured and lived out the rest of their life. Um, we know that is not completely true. There is one person that we've been able to locate the name of and what happened to this person. A few months following treatment, this person relapsed and developed a cancer on his face. Now, Dr. Milbank Johnson saw this patient and said, you go over and get surgery on your face. He didn't go and say, why don't you go back and see Dr. Reif over here and get yourself more Reif ray treatment. He didn't do that. Why? See, there's all these questions. And this enigma of these 16 patients, like what really happened, how they were treated, has a lot of holes in it. And it's really great urban legend stuff, and I don't think there's any doubt at all that people have benefited from the use of frequency devices to treat cancer. We've shown that these days. But there's limitations to it. And some of these limitations seem that, that Dr. Reif was seeing where this one person did relapse have been duplicated even today. There, these things <coughs> So let's talk about Dr. Rive's cancer theory, and it's full of holes too. This took a long time to figure this out and put it all together. But basically, Dr. Rife was up saying in the 1930s, he found a virus that was responsible for cancer, and he called it the BX virus, which he called, he considered was responsible for the initiation of carcinoma. And then later he found a BY virus that he called was responsible for sarcomas. But by the 1950s, Dr. Reif has changed his tune a little bit, and he's going, well, you know, it's really the chemicals produced by the viral infection that gets into the cells and causes transformation of the cells into cancer. Now, okay, um, that's interesting because, you see, if all of a sudden it's no longer a virus that's causing cancer, but it's a chemical that's causing cancer, well, we all know chemicals cause cancer, and how many hundreds of chemicals do we know about now that will cause cancer? It's even more complex than that. How many viruses do we know of that will cause cancer? Just, just a few viruses that are out there, um, like HPV or SV40 or MMTV, all these can cause cancer, and bunches of chemicals cause cancers. So there's some problems, and our problem in here is that the reality is that Dr. Reif wasn't really treating some virus and expecting that as under his theory that you take and remove the cause of the cancer and the cancer goes away. That's not true. We all know that's not true. You can smoke cigarettes for 30 years, develop lung cancer, stop smoking cigarettes, and I guarantee your lung cancer won't go away. So it's, it's a false idea and it, and it might have worked back in the 1930s. People still cling to that today. Now, one of the things Dr. Wright did was he proved the effectiveness of his device by using a medical approach. In other words, you kill something, that's a great deal. 
So he, he would take a sample of some bacteria or some virus or what have you, put it on his microscope, expose it to his device at a particular frequency, and the doggone thing would die. What's really neat about it is, is that you can kill a lot of things with all kinds of methods. You can step on it, you can pour Clorox on it, you can put acid on it, and you know what, it'll kill it. But the difference is here, he could translate what he found by using his frequencies as his device into an actual therapeutic method that would work on human beings and not kill them. That's really great. We can't duplicate that effect using microscopes, <coughs> at least in the full totality that Dr. Wright did. We can do some of this, but not all of it. Modern day methods of evaluation are a little different, and they're much more involved, and they take a lab. But modern day, we can get into biophysiologic investigation, molecular probes, selective antibodies, evaluation of cellular activity, presence of necrosis, ap apoptosis, just to name a few. And later on in the lecture, I'm going to discuss a few more methods of how electromagnetic fields interact and control cell physiology. Now, a lot of people think that a plasma tube being driven by some RF wave merely a radio frequency antenna. This is not true. Plasma tube is really a converter of RF energy into other forms of energy. And some of these forms of energy just are very obvious. You turn a plasma tube on, what comes off? Light, number one. Everybody sees a glow. And that glow is dependent upon the type of gas that is in the tube. And so there's a spectrum that's emitted from the tube based upon the type of glass the gas and, of course, the glass that the tube is made of. Coarse glass, for instance, will pass ultraviolet. Leaded glass will not pass ultraviolet. So you can selectively manipulate the emission spectrum of the tube by just changing the gas. The other thing that comes off the tube, of course, is heat. When you run RF into a tube, that tube gets hot, so there's a localized heat. There's sound waves that come off the tube. There's all kinds of audio waves, level waves, and there's also ultrasonic waves, and these extend out a couple feet from the tube. RF comes off the tube, of course, but it's a minor part of the total emissions. You put in 100 watts of RF, 100 watts of RF don't come out. It's only just a small percentage. There also seems to be a percentage of missing energy that doesn't quite, you add everything up, and it's like something's missing. This may be part of the effectiveness of the device, perhaps not, but that's something to be determined later. So, functional, usable, reliable uh, electromagnetic emitting device that would drive a plasma tube. And one of the things that Dr. Reif originally used was just straight sine wave output frequencies. Philip Hoyland came in and said, hey, you know, if we use harmonics, we can move some of these frequencies that we're using down into a range, an audio range. And one of the advantages of using an audio range is we're now not moving into other radio frequency bands and causing interference. We're like, it's just think about, it's like talking on a radio, a ham radio. And if we do that, we move it down lower and we're not gonna cause problems with our neighbors and we can still achieve effectiveness. So Philip Hoyland kind of came up with the idea of harmonics as far as I can tell. And then one of the misconceptions are that's come up about the use of these RF instruments. Again, RF is not the major active component. It's merely the driver to create the emissions from the tube. And there were some things out in the literature and around the web you'll see where somebody was claiming, oh, we can put up antennas around the city of, of San Diego and we can broadcast these frequencies and cure everybody in the whole city of San Diego from cancer. Well, let me tell you, that won't work. And the other misconception about frequency devices are they're going to cure everything. Well, frequency devices don't cure everything. They have limitations just like every other instrument or tool that is used to treat uh, some physical ailment. And 
based upon the type of frequency device, you have the limitations within that device. For example, an, a, an LED versus an electro-type device versus a plasma-type device versus different types of plasma devices. So we each have limitations, each has applications. I'm going to talk about John Crane. John Crane came into Dr. Rogers' life about the 1950s. And he's the person that helped kind of push the development of electrotype devices, which is the most common type of, a, of frequency devices in usage today. Basically, what John Crane did was he looked at Dr. Rife's instrument and goes, hey, there's a whole lot of uh, just plain out frequency generators being used to treat all kinds of conditions. They use it for muscle stems and to block pain and to help people recover from trauma and re-educate muscles. He said, why don't we just pull the frequency generator out of the frequency of your, of your RF frequency transmitter and just connect it up to somebody. And so they tried that. And lo and behold, the doggone thing worked. And it worked very well. And those type of electro devices are still in use today. And they've been primarily the type of device that people have used for, since about the 1950s. There are limitations to these electro, to these electro type devices. And the most obvious is there's no light emission from them, is there? There's no light spectrum emission from them. There's no acoustic emissions from them either. Now, some people are using acoustic transducers instead of electrodes, um, and they get effects. And I'm going to explain how that can all work a little later on here. And then finally, there's uh, some other problems having to do with what's called skin effect, where you have a problem with high frequencies traveling over the skin. People are into Tesla will understand that. Uh, there's also lines of least resistance. If you can even get an energy into the body, an electrical energy or a signal into the body, it may travel. You could put electrodes here and here, but it may not travel between the two very well. It may travel around the side, or maybe it'll go around the other side, because it's going to follow a line of least resistance. So I'm going to talk now a little bit about some old ripe type devices. And they all have certain things that are similar and to all of them. This is an old picture of a device. We don't know exactly the age of it, but it's estimated to be from late 30s, 1940s. And it's broken down into separate sections. Over here is the audio oscillator. That's a modulator circuit that controls the frequency that the unit treats at. Over here is the power supply of the unit that drives all the power for it. And over here, is the RF transmitter circuit. And there's a little resistor up here that helps balance it. There's an inductor coil that helps balance things. And these two little spots right here here are where the tube connects. And we estimate this, as I said, from the 1930s to 1940s. This is another instrument. This was produced in the late 1940s by uh, an engineer named Bird Thompson, who worked closely with Dr. Rife. And as far as we can tell, it was replicated from a device that went up to Canada with Dr. Bruner, who sent down uh, blueprints and then reconstructed it. And the inside of this looks like this. And it's very similar to what we just saw. This is late 1940s. Here's your power supply. Here's your audio oscillator. Here's your resistor up here. And here's your inductor coil and power, trans power amplifier uh, tube that drives the plasma tube. Very similar. This is an original beam rays device. And you can't see it very well, but right on top here there's a logo and it says beam ray on it. And this was found by the British Wright Group and purchased by them and reconstructed. Mr. Aubrey Schoon on the web has full instructions on how this thing was built. If you reverse engineered it, you can build one for yourself. And unfortunately, it doesn't work very well. People have built these things. They work, but they're not, they're just not as effective as perhaps all the hype that was built up around them. This is a very famous picture, and it was in the San Diego newspaper, I think, in the late 1930s. On the right here is Philip Hoylan, and on the left is Dr. Wright. This is an instrument they built. This is prior to the beam rays instrument. And as far as we can tell, this may have been just a pure sine wave type device. Now, if you notice, there's a meter here. There's a nice little plaque here. There's three switches. 
couple of knobs to control the output, and it's got a plasma tube on an arm. Now, this is, up till now, the only picture that's ever been available in this particular type of device. And about four weeks ago, somebody went looking in an attic and found that. This is the first time anybody's ever seen this public, so you're kind of privileged. And this device is tied up, unfortunately, at this time, and who knows what kind of screwball litigation or, or it, it's, it's not available. So somebody was lucky they got pictures of it before this came up. If you can notice, here's your meter, there's a knob down here. It's not on the other one, it's a little different, but you have your other control knobs. This is your audio oscillator control, that's a band switch as far as I can tell, and some of these other things help move things. See, that's the output level, that's the filament, and I don't know what that metal switch is for. And up here on the right, these are the binding posts that the tube attached to. This is the back side of it. And it's a little different than some of those other pictures, isn't it? Um, here we have the audio oscillator. Down here we have the power supply. And then over here we have the output stages for the RF. And again, there's some differences in this machine versus those other two machines we just saw. And it'd be very interesting if somebody could finally get a hold of this thing, at least re-engineer it, reverse engineer it, and see what this guy does. Because as far as we can tell, this machine may be able to duplicate Dr. Rice in vitro effects. This is a picture of another similar type machine that was found with it's an enlargement that's been pushed a bit. That was found with that old machine. It's some pictures. You can see this is another variant. It has you know, your, your center tuning knob, here's your three switches, and you've got your controls here, and so on. So it's very similar and as far as its control levels, but the way it's put together is just maybe a little different than the, than the other one we just saw. So there's three machines, all of similar construction, two of which no one's ever seen. This is a more modern light bear device, and this is made by Resident Light in Canada. And it has basically a frequency generator, a plasma tube back here, and all the electronics are in one box. What you're looking at here are these little crankshaft-like things. These are actually standing waves that are formed inside the tube. And uh, uh, in other words, the waves interfere and then create a peak, and we get these standing waves here. These are a couple of right bear devices. I built at one time just some experimental things. This is a, uh, on the left, of course, is a nice box unit. On the right is another box unit. And on, what you don't see here is on this unit, just to the side, there's a tube and a tuner for that. This is a more conventional right bear instrument. And it's similar in some ways to Dr. Wright, but this is one of the reasons it's called the right bear. Here we've got a power supply, just like the old ones. There's a frequency generator. Here's your RF generating apparatus. And here's your tuning apparatus for the tube. So it's similar, but it's modernized. And it produces some very dramatic effects. Now there's other instruments. This is called a, a modern beam ray device. There's a company that's come back, starting building the beam ray instrument, as it's called. And it's not really a beam ray, and it has nothing to do with Dr. Reif's original company. But it, it does produce a signal here, and it's all computer controlled, that drives the tube. These are primarily electrically driven versus radio frequency driven. They're very effective. Then there are EMEM devices. What you see up here, these are six tubes. These are all, these are all different gases. Remember I was telling you different gases have different emission spectrum. Different light frequencies have different physiologic effects. And excuse me, down at the bottom here is a, is a picture with the tubes off. This is the driver unit for the tubes, and this is a, the table of bed that the patient sits in. This is owned by an acupuncturist. Next up, this is a modern day electro type device. This is state of the art. This is probably the best instrument on the market. It's the GB4000. It's excellent. Um, a lot of people have these. And again, it's, its lineage goes back to Dr. Crane in the 1950s. And they're very effective. This unit can output up to eight frequencies at one time. So, 
We're going to talk now a little bit about the types of electromagnetic fields. And there are static electric and magnetic fields. Take an electromagnet, or just wind a little electromagnet up, connect it up to a battery, and you got a static electric field. Or just a magnet, static electric field. They all, they both have physiologic effects. And then there are oscillating electric and magnetic fields. If you take a, the same electromagnet, and connect it up to some sort of oscillating source, like a sine wave source, and you put four or 500 hertz in it, well, it'll produce an oscillation of four or 500 hertz. And then finally, you can pulse that electric field, or that magnetic field, and you can have a pulse static magnetic field, or electric field, or you can have a pulse oscillating magnetic field, or electric field, something a little unusual. And best physiologic effects are generally derived from the use of pulsed, static, and oscillating electric, electromagnetic fields. The oscillating electromagnetic fields seem to work a little better. They seem to penetrate. Uh, to give you an idea of how, how effective a pulse can be, you can take an electromagnet, and just by pulsing it, if you check it with a, uh, a Gauss meter when it's in a static mode, it may throw a field off a couple inches from the, from the magnet. If you take and pulse that field, it'll pass right through your body and throw off a good couple of feet. And you can pick it up with the meter, you can stand back and watch the meter go bop, 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 like that, just by pulsing that electromagnet. Now, this is the output of a right bear device. And basically, it's a pulsed, oscillating, electromagnetic uh, output. And so, if you look at it in one, one version here, there's a pulse that's generated of, of radio frequency energy. And if you open up that pulse, it looks something like that, where you've got an oscillation in there. Now, there's some questions about how do pulsed electromagnetic fields create physiologic effects. And that's EEMF, you'll be seeing that a lot. That stands for pulsed electromagnetic field. And basically, a transmitted electromagnetic pulse will penetrate and affect the whole body. Instead of using electrodes, which kind of affect a localized area or may, as I said, due to lines of least resistance and such, only affect certain areas of the body, an electromagnetic pulse of some sort can affect the entire body. And pulse electromagnetic fields manipulate cellular, molecular, electrokinetics, and membrane and cellular membrane activity. Now, we're going to get into that a little bit, and some of this is going to get a little more complex, a little more, uh, shall we say, medical or, or biological. But we kind of need to go there because that is where the future of life lies and the future of frequency treatment lies. So there's a whole variety of methods whereby pulsed electromagnetic fields can manipulate cellular physiology. And these electrokinetic terms relate to the direct conversion of electrical energy into kinetic energy kinetic energy into electrical energy. Basically, it is via these electrokinetic mechanisms that pulsed electromagnetic fields act to create individual effects and can interact with biochemicals. Now, in relation to pulsed electromagnetic field effects, there's something you should know. The cell's bilayer lip plasma membrane, lipid plasma membrane, can be compared to a capacitor. So when placed in a pulsed electromagnetic field, the charges will accumulate along the plasma membrane, changing the charging and changing the potential difference from that of the resting state. So you can like add charge to cells by doing this. That's going to be very important. We're going to discuss how important that is coming up here in a minute. Now, many of the effects of pulsed electromagnetic fields are field dependent. They're just general. Put something in a field of, of certain frequency and you know what you leave it there for a while and things are going to happen it's going to the cell being a living organism or a living unit it's going to react to that field in some way and fields extend across a wide range these can be sound light radio frequency of course electricity magnetism and here's what's really wonderful is some effects are frequency dependent and that gives us the ability to manipulate cellular physiology in a specific manner for a specific outcome and it's via the combination of fields and frequencies that one can selectively and manipulate and control cell physiology. Now, can 
going to talk about a few of the key electrokinetic mechanisms. Electroconformational coupling, ECC, big stuff. One of the reasons it's big is because it's a way to manipulate cellular proteins. Cellular proteins have a whole lot to do with the basis of life, have a whole lot to do with our health. And basically what it is, you're synchronizing, by synchronizing an electromagnetic field of a certain frequency to the frequency of a protein, frequency that the protein is tumbling or moving, or interacting, the interaction can increase the rate of chemical reactions of the protein and, it, and include the exchange of energy between the field and the conformation of the molecule. In other words, you can change the conformation of the protein. What's such a big deal about that? Well, I'm sure most of you have heard of prions. And one of the problems with prions is it's a tangled protein. Well, if you can get in somehow and find the right frequency for prions, you can change your conformation without destroying the molecule and make it inactive. There's a whole variety of things that be done here. And that all goes down to certain other proteins that are very toxic to the body. So it's, it's like especially like bacterial endotoxins, which bacteria produce, which make us ill. You can somehow get in and affect those with further research and change your conformation. You can deactivate the toxicity of a bacteria. So I'm going to talk about a few more here. Electroendocytosis. Now, this is really neat stuff because a low power pulsed electromagnetic field causes the absorption of large macromolecules into the cell via, via vesicle compartment-like structures. And the molecular weights can be as high as 2 million. These are huge molecules, huge molecules. So that's really neat because it means there's an opportunity here to introduce different types of compounds to the body and have them get into the cell simply by using those compounds along with a pulse electromagnetic field. You can use these things for therapeutic purposes in conjunction with biochemically active compounds. And this can be herbs, it can be all kinds of nutritional supplements, and it can also be, of course, medications. Now, Electroosmosis is basically just electrically driven osmosis. <coughs> you know about osmosis and things moving across a membrane. Well, if you charge that membrane, guess what? You can create an osmotic effect. And so you can move molecules in and out of that membrane. When we get down here, we're going to talk about a little bit of coherence. Now, entrainment and, and entrainment. Entrainment, for our purposes, is a forced synchronization of biological processes pulsed electromagnetic field of a specific frequency. So if you think about that, if you have a cell that is malfunctioning, its internal biochemical processes are not synchronized at some point. Something's wrong. And you can entrain that cell to an external frequency and bring all the molecules within it into synchronized, into some kind of synchrony with that frequency thus align those molecules so that they are functioning as a coherent unit. In other words, we have a situation in which coherence binds and creates a, a similar type of phase relationship within the molecules and their activity. Now, in electrokinetics, we have to remember that there is a conversion of electrical energy to kinetic energy kinetic energy to electrical energy. So pulse electromagnetic fields are administered as a train of pulses, and this creates cyclic fluctuation-driven effects. And when these fluctuating effects interact in phase, they can summon and thus increase the effect beyond that accomplished by a single pulse. So again, this is all part of the entrainment coherence effect. And resonance, now a whole lot of stuff's talked about with Dr. Wright for resonance. And the pulsed electromagnetic field creates electrical and acoustic signals within the cells in the body. And these signals will have the same frequency as a pulse, and they can create these resonance effects that are so widely talked about in, in the right field. Now, there's a few other important pulsed electromagnetic field effects. Um, 
We were talking a little bit about how proteins can be activated by ECC. Well, enzymes can be activated by pulse electromagnetic fields. You can activate enzymes so they become more active. Their resistance to infection, um, what people don't know is that a lot of bacteria that are considered pathologic aren't always pathologic. They have genes in them that up and down regulate that turns off their virulence. Now one of the things that will kick a non-pathogenic bacteria into a virulent state is that when it comes in contact with a cell or group of cells that have a lower plasma cell membrane potential. In other words, it's a sick cell. And that thing goes, I've got a victim, and it turns itself on. And it turns on those virulence genes. And then it starts reproducing. And the problem is, it doesn't shut off. If you, there's a, there's a potential here for the use of pulse electro, electromagnetic fields to selectively turn on and turn off these genes within bacteria. I think that's possibly one of the ways that modern electromagnetic frequency devices work to combat infection. Now, each, heat shock proteins are very interesting things. These are cellular chaperones. They can elicit pulse electromagnetic fields, can elicit uh, heat shock protein production, and they have a lot to do with immunity. Heat shock proteins take and transport pathogens and, and cellular irritants up to the dendritic cells of the immune system. And when it gets to those dendritic cells, the dendritic cells then encode them, send things off, and the immune system reacts and starts forming antibodies. Really wonderful stuff. So that's another way pulse electromagnetic fields can work. Finally, if we come to viral infections, when a virus attacks a cell, it comes up to a cell, attaches itself to the plasma membrane, and then the, to get into the cell, you know what it does? It drops the plasma membrane potential, and it burrows right through the plasma membrane into the cell. Once it's in the cell, then it changes the cell's physiology, lowers the cell's plasma membrane potential so, the cell, so that the viruses can escape. Now, if you introduce an external field, charge that little cell up, to a certain level, well, I think that's one of the reasons that frequency devices work against viral infections, is you're charging the cells and you're keeping, A, the virus from being able to invade the cell, and B, you may be keeping the virus, viruses that have already infected cells from leaving the cell because you've introduced this charge and the doggone viruses cannot exit the cell. That's the potential. Somebody needs to do a little research with that, but I think that's one of the reasons this works. <coughs> You notice it also increases wound healing. Now, we can utilize pulse electromagnetic fields in many different ways, but basically we're going to use them to manipulate cell physiology. There's positive effects of just the electromagnetic fields on the inhibition of cancer growth and infections. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. They can enhance chemotherapy, radiation, and antibiotics. Remember I said we can move big molecules into and out of cells by using pulse electromagnetic fields. And the neat thing is being a field that produces whole body versus discrete penetration <coughs> saturation. So if you have a physical complaint and you take some medication that you want to use or herb or, or nutritional supplement you want to use throughout your entire body, if you use it with a pulse electromagnetic field, you'll get better effects out of it. It moves that into your cells in a better, in a more effective manner. So let's talk for a minute just about cancer, because this is one of the things Dr. Wright was well known for. And <coughs> cancer has certain attributes to it. And up here I've got a little list. A normal healthy cell has a transmembrane potential of 70 to 100 millivolts. And a cancerous cell has 30 millivolts or less. You have a low mitochondrial membrane potential in a healthy cell, and there's a high mitochondrial membrane potential in a cancer cell. Now this high mitochondrial membrane potential is one of the reasons the cancer cells are so doggone tough. Because when the mitochondrial membrane potential drops below a certain level, the cell self-destructs. It's called apoptosis. That can be initiated. But because it's so doggone high, they're tough. They just don't break down and they don't respond well to, to a lot of the chemicals that are used to treat cancer and all the other medicines that are used to treat it. Other differences are, remember, we've got a, in a normal cell, you've got a high internal concentration of potassium, magnesium, calcium, and zinc. 
And in a cancer cell, you've got low levels of potassium, magnesium, calcium, and zinc. And then over here in a healthy cell, you've got a low internal sodium level and low level of, hydro of water, so to speak. And in a cancer cell, you've got high internal sodium levels and high amounts of water. Then over here in a healthy cell, you've got high ATP production and a high pH. In other words, they're kind of alkaline. They like alkalinity. And in cancer cells, you've got low ATP production. They like to form their energy by glycolysis. Glycolysis is how it's called. And there's lots of acid production. There's a low pH around cancer. Finally, there's a net cellular positive charge in a healthy cell. And a cancer cell has a net cellular negative charge. So remember, I was talking about we can manipulate ions and we can manipulate the transport of things across the cellular membrane with and charge the cellular membrane by using an externally applied pulse electromagnetic field. So what do you think is going to happen to the cellular physiology of the cancer cell if we charge this from 30 millivolts to 100 millivolts? Well, things are going to start shifting, won't they? Because we're affecting some of these levels of potassium, the levels of sodium. I don't know necessarily if we're going to change this the uh, activity, the metabolic activity, but we're also going to change the, the charge on the, on the cell. And that's going to disrupt the cancer cells. And it's going to cause problems to it that can be lethal to them. And not in a, in a way that's normally thought of, but in a very different way, because you've just changed a very abnormal cell back towards a normal cell. And how that all interplays, I don't know. But it does show up in some of the clinical tests that have been run. Now, here's something. I'm going to take a little thing here, and we're going to talk about this, but and, and just review this. But pulse electromagnetic fields of absorption incorporates medications into cells, and it increases the electric potential of the plasma membrane, it results in voltage-dependent ion gating, electroosmosis, and electroendocytosis. Things I just talked about. We can initiate active transport into the cells by pulse electromagnetic fields, and that is field and frequency dependent, and E-enforced vibration of free ions occurs with low frequency oscillating fields related to, and that's related to electroconformational coupling and entrainment. That's important because it has to do with metabolic rates. If you oscillate, if you take and heat up or oscillate some particular molecule, it generally increases its rate of reaction. So things to think about. Now I'm going to take a little turn here, and um, I'm going to talk about what might be considered an inversion. The intention is to demonstrate how pulsed electromagnetic fields can be utilized in the treatment of cancer. Ultimately, the acceptance of pulsed electromagnetic field or frequency therapies in cancer treatment depends upon a bridge being formed between the existing, the existing treatment paradigm and that of frequencies. We need to be able to do that. Well, there is a method for that. There's actually some patents on some of this stuff. But bottom line is, pulsed electromagnetic fields increase medication cytotoxicity via increased uptake. There's lower chemotherapeutic dosage as required with pulsed electromagnetic fields. An opportunity where people can be treated with chemotherapy medications, use lower doses, have fewer side effects, and have better outcomes. And there's clinical evidence to show this happens. There's actually patents that are on this basis at this time. These are some of the uh, known <coughs> chemotherapeutic medications that have shown an enhancement effect. PDT is photodynamic therapy. It's a way of sensitizing a cancer or other type of uh, abnormal <coughs> cellular structure with a chemical that is photoreactive to sign up a light on it of a specific frequency. Well, it, they also re relate and react to externally applied pulsed electromagnetic So, here's some of the things. Pulse electromagnetic fields and chemotherapeutic medications show a consistent ability to, to increase response rates and increase survival times over chemotherapy alone. They also show the ability to eradicate tumors and, in the words of some authors, to actually produce a cure. So, here's some things. If you look at, here we got, for example, for an increased effectiveness, here's adriamycin plus P 
EMF diminished cell proliferation by 82% in osteosarcoma. Adriamycin, adriamycin alone, 19%. It's a fourfold increase in effectiveness. Um, here's one down here with B16 melanotic mice. That's, mel that's melanoma. And they had a 26% cure rate using these two together. That's really phenomenal. Here's a couple more. You can see that we have with these things. Here's some cure rates using different types of uh, chemicals, bio, uh, chemotherapy medications. In this case, a cure rate of up to 83 percent. Significantly, uh, with colon cancer here, we had a significant tumor size reduction and prolongation of survival times. I mean, that's really remarkable when you're dealing with colon cancer and conventional treatment as most people undergo these days. So you can combine the two and achieve possibly some really phenomenal effects. Now one of the major unsolved problems in cancer treatment today is that, is that of multidrug resistance. What may work one time for a patient all too often will just stop working or not work at a later date. And there's evidence of pulsed electromagnetic fields will overcome multidrug resistance mechanisms. Again, remember cancer cells have a low transmembrane potential if we charge up that cell with an external field, the medication cannot be excreted against the field back out of the cancer cell. Now, down here at the bottom, or up here, it goes increased DOX and midblasting levels to resist murine leukemia cell lines. And that's exactly what I was talking about. The doxorubicin goes in, it can't get out because there's a field outside of it, and it just holds it in there becomes toxic to the cancer cells and kills them. Now, here's something that goes back to the 1934 clinic, because you see there's an interaction between pulsed electromagnetic fields and X-radiation. And ionized irradiation, when used with pulsed electromagnetic fields, show consistent increases in mutation rates and DNA strand breaks over X-radiation alone. Field increase the damage induced by X-ray meaning it may be possible to decrease the dosage of X radiation and still achieve the same effectiveness from a higher exposure dosage. So when you use a pulsed electromagnetic field with X radiation to treat cancer, you use it after, immediately after, you apply the X radiation. Now, the combination of effects with pulsed electromagnetic fields and antibiotics is called the bioelectro it's called the bioelectric effect, and you can look that up, it's in the literature. And basically, it is especially useful to overcome biofilm resistance to antibiotics. Biofilms are a thin film that, that bacteria form, and it's like, a, think of it as a coat of paint that keeps antibiotics from affecting the bacteria. And you can wind up with some very tenacious bacterial infections in your body that can't be treated with normal antibiotics. Combine them with pulsed electromagnetic fields, and not only the electromagnetic fields have an effect on the bacteria for the right frequency is used, but if you use it with antibiotics, you get a combination effect. And it can be possibly very effective. And some of the things that have been shown are genomycin, vancomycin, which is like an antibiotic the last resort is used for MRSA or, or that. So these flesh eating diseases you hear about, tobermycin, octetracycline. And down here at the bottom, uh, PEMF increases the effectiveness of biocytes. These are the things that are used to clean hospitals. And one of the problems is, is all these bacteria and little organisms that are in hospitals have become resistant to biocides. And by perhaps taking a frequency device, a field type device, putting it in a hospital room after it's been scrubbed down, or a surgical suite, you may be able to increase the effectiveness of the clean that was just done in the hospital, in the room, and thus limit any kind of associated infections that might happen. That's one of the problems that many people have when they go to the hospital. They go unhealthy and they come up with some massive resistant infection of some sort. So these are some of the organisms that have shown a combination of pulse electromagnetic fields and, and antibiotics, bioelectric effect, to be effective to uh, some of the staphylococcus and dermatis and uh, some of these others are very common within the hospital setting and cause a lot of grief for people. So we're going to talk now about something really neat. And 
One of the things you can do with pulse electromagnetic fields is you can manipulate the, genet the genetics of an organism. And it's been known for some years that genes and DNA are pulsed electromagnetic field responsive. What isn't widely known is that the response can be manipulated to a specific outcome <coughs> via changes in exposure time, field strength, and frequency. So just so everybody knows, there's a whole lot of stuff going on about there, out there about how cell phones cause cancer and power lines cause cancer and all that. Well, there's hundreds of studies that have shown at least 85 known non-mutated cancer genes, cancer-related genes, show no to negligible EM damage when exposed to electromagnetic fields. So there may be a few genes that show some kind of problems after being exposed to electromagnetic fields, but the majority are not. And pulsed EM fields are generally, within certain limits, fairly safe. So, pulse electromagnetic fields have their own unique abilities in the treatment of cancer. And what we're looking at here are some of the, th some of the things that affect cancer. These are some of the genes that have to do with cancer. And as you can see, here are some of the frequencies that are used to manipulate these genes. There's P53 is downregulated by 50 hertz. Now, P53 is very well-known cancer-promoting gene, vascular endothelial growth factor, which has to do with growing more blood supply to supply a cancer cell and allow its growth, is inactivated by 120 hertz field. So if you want to slow the growth of cancer, some people know about chart cartilage and other anti-angiogenesis type compounds, um, you can do it with frequencies. And EGFR is another one that has to do with growth factors. P10 um, has to do with healing. So you can move up and down certain things uh, and frequencies by utilizing certain frequencies. You can, you can affect certain genes here that have to do with cancer. Now, this offers an opportunity because there's a lot of unknown frequencies at the moment that can be used for even more genes that relate to cancer. And here's just a few that offer some potential for investigation that somebody needs to look at. And you start putting these, if you can affect these particular frequencies, with frequencies, these particular genes, you can start affecting cancer in ways that heretofore have not been done. They're looking, in the medical world, they're looking for chemicals to do this. Well, we can do with frequencies. I mean, and you just start changing frequencies and start checking. It's really not that hard. Compared to how much money and time, effort, and energy you're spending trying to find chemicals that will do that. Now, pulse electromagnetic fields on their own have their own unique abilities in the treatment of cancer. And there's consistent evidence of increased survival time, tumor shrinkage, and anti-neoangiogenesis effects based upon the application of specific frequencies and field strengths. Now, something important. By themselves, frequencies do not cure cancer in the literature. As discussed earlier, only when pulse electromagnetic fields are used in conjunction with chemotherapeutic medications or other methods of treatment encourage including natural therapies as a cure possible. When you start talking, if you know somebody's been cured of cancer using a frequency device, you start talking to them, you're going to find, well, what else did you do? Some of the first words out of your mouth. And 99% of the time, they're going to say, well, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. And I did this, and I did this. They didn't just use a frequency device by, them, by itself. And I must encourage people, if they're going to use a frequency device, they should use a frequency device to treat serious diseases along with a variety of other complementary treatments that would affect the particular problem that the person has. Do not just use a frequency device by itself. You'll be disappointed with the outcome. Here's a few frequencies that affect things. And as you can see, uh, some of these are general, and remember I was telling you 120 hertz uh, deactivated that vascular endothelial growth factor gene, or well, here's another thing, reduced growth and vascularization of implanted breast cancers in mice. There's a uh, reinforcement of that. There's some more frequencies used in cancer. Now what's interesting about this particular study, because it's an actual human study using glioblastoma patients, 
electrodes are attached to the patient's scalp and worn 24 hours a day. And the field strength at the tumor site was uh, created to run at two volts per centimeter. And the patients, unfortunately, had to wear this thing 24 hours a day. They had to shave their heads. Glioblastoma is a type of brain cancer. And I uh, keep these electrodes attached. But some really neat things happened because the median survival time to progression was 26.1 weeks and survival was 62 weeks. This is more than double the reported medians of, his, of historical control patients. Now, one of the other things that came out of this study is that some of the frequencies were found to be effective against other types of specific cancers. And for example, 100,000 hertz was mouse melanoma, 150,000 hertz human breast cancer, and 200,000 hertz was a human glioblastoma. So uh, this was a really great study, and this company is located in Israel and is still continuing with their studies. Here's some more frequencies used in colon cancer and, and different cancers. And uh, you can see here we've got this 50 hertz with a 40% tumor growth inhibition, 10 to 120,000. This is this is this 10 to 120,000 hertz that's also done by that same group in a different study uh, over in Israel. And here's some very low frequencies, which are not normally used in cancer treatment, but there is some effectiveness apparently down in it. Now, finally, there's this big question about how do we find frequencies? Well, most frequencies, of course, are empirically derived. And, uh, in other words, you try it, and, and if it works, great. If it doesn't work, you try a different one. So there are other ways to, 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 to find and, and locate frequencies based upon computation. One way is called the ion paramagnetic model. Um, this is an interesting thing because, frankly, it, it kind of works and it doesn't work. I'll give you an example. Uh, it was used in one paper to determine the resonant frequency of zinc. And a zinc ion is located within the P53 protein. And then this was tested, this frequency was tested on cancers with a mutant form of P53 that allowed the promotion of cancer. And 20 hertz caused the inhibition of tumor growth. Now the question is, did the 20 hertz work because it was a frequency that affected other things? Or was it because it actually affected zinc? Or did it affect the cancer itself? I don't know, but they calculated 20 hertz based on this ion paramagnetic model. And, and it did have some effectiveness. It's another method. It's called the molecular weight to frequency method. And that is, if you know the molecular weight of a particular chemical compound, an atom, or a protein, <coughs> then you can derive a resonant frequency for it. And you can take this resonant frequency and divide it down by subharmonics and perhaps derive a usable frequency. This frequency is up and like, likely very that <coughs> you're going to wind up with, with that. Um, this, I, I've actually tried this a little bit with some certain things, and the effects seem to be homeopathic. For example, if you create a frequency for gold, gold is used homeopathically to treat uh, nervous system conditions and mental imbalances, and it seems to do that. So it, it may have some effectiveness, but not in the way that's expected. You can't go and make a frequency for opium and expect to get a buzz off it. It won't happen. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> right. Finally, we're going to come up here to the DNA method of frequency computation. And this is a new patent that was just issued last year to Charbon. And the concept is that if one has a known uh, chain of base pairs, or which con constitute a strand of DNA or a gene, the base pairs within the gene are a certain distance apart. And you can take an average of these, and then from that average, one can derive a length. And from that length, that becomes a wavelength. And from the wavelength, one can then create a frequency, and then derive down via the use of subharmonics to create a subharmonic frequency. This works. I've used this, and it's been very effective. Not all frequencies you derive using this method work. A great many do. And um, don't really understand why and how that is, but I can just tell you, this can be a very effective method. For example, if you need to attack a certain microorganism, like a bacteria or a virus or a mold or what have you, this can be very effective for some of these. So in closing, I just want to say that I hope today I've shown you that a lot of what's gone on with Dr. Reif and the, and the 
theories and the, and the urban legends are just flat wrong. And that we need to move forward. And I hope what I've done today is I've established like the foundations for a new science that we can make out of the use of frequency devices. It's vital that occur. There's so much work being done on this level right now. And all that's needed is further research. And but people don't know, well, where do we go? How do we, how does that accomplish? And I hope today I've shown a little bit about how we can get to the future from here. Thank you all. out is trained in, in certain skills and certain methods of treatment and they get out and find hey you know there's there are other ways to do things and unfortunately yes there is FDA suppression that that is true and what it comes down to sometimes is like uh, an individual practitioner's own state laws and their own ability and how they wish to approach this in a way Frequency, use of frequency devices and frequencies is not really the practice of medicine or dentistry or chiropractic or naturopathy or any of those things. It's actually a whole separate healing paradigm. It's a whole new science. And I've, I've talked to several people that have uh, been thinking about perhaps even starting schools and starting a whole new degree curriculum. But it's just talk at this time, and maybe that will come about. But I think some long life bridge needs to be made as to who is uh, and, and how to get connected with things. Uh, there are certainly some, some lists, and, but as far as like real valid feedback from other practitioners that are using things, no one's really doing that. Some, there's some few great people that'll talk openly, but I think um, you know, at some of the big conferences, like, uh, where's Dr. Hollenbanger here? There he is. Um, he, he speaks over at, uh, a couple of these big conferences, but there's this, this anti-aging group and clinical nutrition groups, and there's probably a lot of people there you can interact and and, and work with and, and, and meet with that would be more than willing to discuss what they're doing with other professionals. Um, Here, let me, let me. I was just going to say I did some research in '98 and 2000 using nutrient cocktails and pulse electromagnetic field devices in neurological disorders, and you can see changes beginning within 45 minutes of initiating treatment and definite changes every day over six days. Thank you. Um, there's been reports coming out in China for the last two years that they have some kind of a device that's applying radio frequency and using resonance on tumors, and they've used it in about 20,000 cases and have had a pretty high success rate. This is apparently becoming common practice in China. Any information on that? I don't know anything at all about that. Uh, the use of radio frequency devices to treat tumors is not new. Um, there are devices on the market right now, for example, the Oncotherm, which is a form of forced radio frequency heating, and they use these frequencies, pulse frequencies, to treat the tumors, and they get very good results with that. I don't know if that's what they're doing in China now. It's widely used in Europe, however. Uh, yes. Do you have any experience with Hunter Clark Zephyr and how this falls into this topic? 
Well, the, the Clark zapper, remember I said some, some effects are general, and it just has to do with the frequency. And the, what Dr. Clark found was that the use of a frequency of around 40,000 hertz can be used for long periods of time and just achieve effects that are general on a whole wide range of difficulties and physical complaints. It doesn't work for everything. It's very power limited, and that's one of the problems also with many electrodes on devices. You can only put three or four watts of power into the body, or you're going to electrocute yourself. Um, there's someone over here, yes. Uh, this is more of a context. I know, I'd like to put this in a historical context. Uh, many of you do not know that ancient Egyptian physicians have recognized the difference between the electromagnetic wavelengths of healthy cells as opposed to foreign partial cells. You call them signatures. And they have treated <coughs> the sick body with essential oils that have compatible electromagnetic wavelengths to the healthy cells of the patient, by which way they have excluded the livelihood of the foreign harmful organ. Yes, um, I don't know if that was caught well on the thing, but basically uh, this gentleman, I think, is saying that the electromagnetic signature of essential oils have been used by Egyptians going back quite some time in history. And again, this has to do with some of these things I was talking about, where we're talking about entrainment and coherence, and you're bringing up the energy and the, and the energy and the charges within the cells into a level that is in balance with those particular essential oils. I think it's very important that we realize there's a lot of different ways to achieve this, and the use of applied chemicals is but one. Um, again, Dr. Hollowanger over here has these wonderful things called life waves. You should check them out. That is some of the basis of that, how they work to some degree. And uh, the use of essential oils is, is a historic, wonderful thing that is in the Western world, it's just starting to be explored. It's been around, you say, in Egypt for a long time and in other parts of the Middle East. Um, there's someone else over here? Yes, sir. Is there any difference between, say, unidirectional pulse versus sinusoid? Is there any difference between a universal pulse? Uh, a unidirectional. Yes. A unidirectional, in other words, like a square wave versus yeah. a sinusoidal. Uh, well, here's what happens. If you take a sinusoid wave and you don't pulse it, then you don't achieve very strong physiologic effects. But if you pulse that sinusoid wave, where you've got a pulsed oscillating wave at the same frequency as the square wave, you achieve essentially a little better effect. Yes, ma'am. Let me just show definitively whether the rice equipment was destroyed uh, by the FDA or whether there are really prototypes that are working so that we really fully understood what he did, not only in his radiation devices, but his microscope. I've heard very mixed opinions on this, and of course, there are, are the various marketed devices out there. I'd like to hear your viewpoint oh, on all right. All well, that. okay, yes, uh, she was asking about uh, if uh, the FDA destroyed all the right devices, if there's still some around, what's happened with the microscope, and she's heard varied opinions about uh, what's what. Well. Number one, I don't think the FDA has destroyed a lot of the right devices. I showed you a picture of one that was just found. And then just a few years ago, that other beam resistor was found in reverse engineer. I think the original right instruments, uh, with a little luck, maybe it could be rebuilt from that instrument that was just found. As far as the FDA <coughs> destroying units, um, I'm sure there's been one or two, but there just never were many right instruments to start with. So if they got a hold of a couple of them, they didn't get them all. And some of them, I think, were destroyed. I, I was at a conference one time, and there's a fellow there who said, well, you know, my father had one of these back in the 40s. And when the war started, the uh, military came around and said, you can't use this because it produces RF radiation. And uh, they, all radio transmitters, transmitters were shut down in the United States during World War II outside of commercial broadcast. So they, he said that he, he and his brother just basically destroyed it. <laughs> and that was the end of that. So there, there were, there are, I'm sure there's still instruments out there. As far as the microscope goes, the microscope's kind of off in limbo. Uh, and is it really that great a tool? Well, I can tell you that people have replicated it. And I can't say more than that. And what about the, the various so-called bright devices on the market, the radio right. tubes, et cetera? Okay, well, as far as, far as those go, there, there's, a, there's a big problem. Um, 
sometimes it comes up, and that is people overreach capabilities and, and claims. And it's not that they don't work, they do work, but they, they, they use this credibility via association sometimes. It's like, well, I'll put the name right on it, that makes it's going to cure 16 out of 16 people out of cancer. Um, probably not. But will it do other things? You betcha. And they can be very effective for a variety of conditions, but unfortunately the manufacturers overreach and overstate, and, and that's a real problem that exists in the industry. And what about harm? Potential harm, harm from those so-called right devices out there? Well, the worst harm that could come from them generally um, is the fact that a person would be treating themselves uh, thinking that somehow if they just treat long enough, they're going to get well, and that doesn't happen and they don't seek other treatment. No, after, after a certain period of time, if it's not working, it's not working. I don't care what the hype is. It's just not working. That's it. Yes, sir. Is there a list of the up-to-date machines out on the market? Can we get a copy of it? I don't have that, but there's a couple websites you can find a lot of that on. Um, one of them is, uh, right, let's see, it's uh, the Right Forum, rightforum.com. That's one place to find it. Uh, I think there might be, Dr. Nina Silver is about to come out with a book that has a lot of devices uh, uh, reviewed in it, N-E-N-A-H-S-Y-L-D-E-R, and uh, she has a website, I don't know what that is. Oh, I can do that. It's, uh, Well, how does this ultimate blood magnetic field 
have a net beneficial versus activating toxins also. Okay, well, here's, here's the problem. Um, number one, you have to, if you're going to use pulse electromagnetic fields with a chemotherapeutic medication, you have to reduce the dosage. And what I tell people is if they're going to do that, if they're going to do chemotherapy and the use of a frequency device, they need to wait about 48 hours or to 72 hours after they've been administered the, their medication before they use it because it potentiates. There's actually been a study where they kill the mice by using standard dosages. So, but it is effective. There's a fellow here in town right now. I did not treat him, but he used one of my devices. Um, he had pancreatic cancer, and he is right now in total remission, and that was within about 100 days of treatment. The, the term is called drug uptake enhancement, if you want to Google it. Thank you. I think I'm out of time here. Thank you all very much.